Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house this morning on the first Sunday after Trinity. Um, the colors have changed. We've, we've gone to green and we will be green now for really uh, much of the remainder of the church year. We've reached about the halfway point in the church year. The first half or festival half of the church year is primarily uh, concerned with the events of Christ's life and ministry. And they focus on a lot of the events in Christ's life and, and their significance for the church. In the second half of the church year, the Trinity or Pentecost season, uh, there's a slight shift as the church begins to focus more on his teaching and on the teachings of the apostles, which will form the foundation uh, for the church now for the better part of, of 2,000 years. So, uh, in a tip of the hat to the changing of the season and the slight change of emphasis, I thought it was maybe a good time that we also change the order of service that we use. So, beginning today, we'll be using Divine Service 1. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I don't think it's maybe one that you are as familiar with. The service is outlined on the side. I've substituted a hymn for the offertory a little later in the service, but it's all outlined on the side of your bulletin, uh, and I suspect that after a few weeks you'll know this one as well as you do Divine Service 3 as well. Um, so I invite you to, page, to turn to page 151, and we'll begin this morning with our preparations. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the hymn.
of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord.
The epistle is from 1 John chapter 4. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so, al so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. I love Pilate, he suffered and was buried. 
And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn. How about the poor beggar? 
Lazarus, that's Lazarus, of course. And just in case you're wondering, not the Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead, Mary and Martha's brother, probably just some other Lazarus that he's telling the story about. Oh, Pastor, it's all so confusing. Oh, really? Really? We have three Katie's in my family. Get over it. Lazarus. Literally understood. Literally translated, one who trusts God, or one helped by God. But the other guy, God doesn't tell us. It's as if God doesn't even know his name. Doesn't know him. And this little subtle detail is the first of several pretty chilling words in this story once told by Jesus. Oh, there are others, the five foolish virgins, who will hear the bridegroom say one day, I never knew you. They're on the outside, never to come in. So this rich guy's name, their names, are not written in the book of life. That's chilling. And it is, and it should be, a sobering story for those of us still working our way through the wilderness that is our life this side of the last day. Just think about some of the other words and phrases that are used by Jesus as he tells this story. And he speaks of the place where this man went. Hell. Torment. Father Abraham far off in the distance. Anguish in flame. A great chasm separating the two places so that no one might cross either way. Torment. All of these words are used to describe that future reality for the rich man. And so, in this story, we're given a glimpse at the reality that would otherwise probably be hidden from us. The reality, whether we like to admit it or not, that is heaven or hell. Not heaven and hell, but heaven or hell. Because there is a great chasm. Phew. Well, thank goodness I'm not like that rich guy. Whew. So we're not him? Then I guess we must be beggars. Poor. Covered with sores. Desiring to eat scraps. Not sure that describes me very aptly. But, but, I'm certainly not rich. Really? Really? Just ask some third world family that don't even have access to clean water or enough food to survive without worry. Compare our lives with that of those skinny, dying, sick kids that they sometimes show on TV that we like to change the channel so we don't have to watch it. Folks, who's rich and who's poor? But Pastor, have you looked at your retirement account in the last few days? The last couple of months? When you lose that much, you certainly can't be rich. Folks, if you're losing that much, chances are you are rich. Right? It's kind of like those people that complain about what a high tax bracket they're in and how much taxes they have to pay. Oh, when, when? Hmm. 
But if we get hung up on how rich or poor we are, or aren't, or how rich or poor we would like to be, or can be, or should be, then we're actually making the mistake of thinking that the rich man was damned because he was rich. And Lazarus was saved because he was poor. And if we're thinking that way, it might very well be that we begin thinking that our salvation depends on us. And if that's true, we're a lot more like the rich guy than we would probably like to admit. Look, let's be clear. And tell your old Adam to calm down a little bit. But being rich is not a sin. <laughs> Good. It's not a sin, but it is very dangerous. Very dangerous. Jesus himself says so. Yeah, but I can handle it. Come on, God, give me a shot. No. And being poor isn't our ticket to heaven either. Many poor in this world, in this life, will experience what the rich man endured in the story as well. But the named one, the one whom God knew, who knew his name, Lazarus, the one helped by God, the one who trusts in God, he believed God's promises. And he trusted in him, not in himself or his wealth or his goodness. And so, in accordance with God's promises and goodness, the name one is taken to heaven. He was saved by faith, just as Abraham was so many years earlier. And so, it is very fitting, I think, that Abraham, the rich guy, yeah, Abraham was very blessed, very wealthy, and Lazarus are there together, side by side, both saved by faith, both believing God's promises. And God does keep his promises. And so as we imagine the stars in the heavens that night there above Abram's tent, they, they are an attempt to number the descendants, the children of Abraham, not Jews by ethnicity or blood, but those who believe in God. Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai, do finally have a child. And the Savior, the promised offspring, did come. And he took away the sin of the world by laying down his life as the once and for all time perfect sacrifice, the propitiation for our sin. That very same one has put his name on you. When he claimed you, washed you, and promised to be with you, to bless you, and to sustain you. But, uh, but if we're not the rich guy, and God help us never to be him, if we're not so caught up in the riches and pleasures of this world, that we are practically blinded to our own sinful and selfish condition. But we're not really all that poor. Then who are we? Who are we in the story? Who are we to identify with? Ah, maybe we're one of the brothers. 
Perhaps. Perhaps. And if so, then the question becomes, what's it going to take to get you to repent? Is God's word enough, the law and the prophets? Is his word and the sacraments enough to do the job? Maybe if someone were to rise from the dead to warn us and to call us to repentance, maybe that would do it. Maybe that would be enough to open our eyes to turn toward him in repentance and trust. Okay, so let me answer the question I posed on my sermon text for today. Who are you? You are Lazarus. For you trust in God perfectly, all the time? No, but you trust in God. Are you poor? Spiritually, in a sense, if all you have to offer is what you bring to the party, yeah, you're dirt poor. You have nothing to offer of any value. Are you covered with sores? Yeah. Sin and all that it brings with it. That's our reality in the here and now, this side of the last day. Yeah, that describes us. But that's not such a terrible thing. For you have been baptized. You have been forgiven. You have been fed and nourished with God's holy word and with his son's own bodies and blood. God knows you. Each and every one of you. He put his mark on you and he has called you by name. He has made you one of his beloved children. And your name has been written in the book of life. Not because you're poor. Not because you do good. Not because you're even better than most. Better than some. Better than a few. But because he loves you. He looked down and he sees you as one that he desires to love. One he desires to claim and to rescue and to redeem, to comfort, to encourage and support. He loves you and so he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die for you. And he loves you enough to come and take on our human flesh to become one of us and to shed his blood in a horrific scene there on the cross of Calvary where he shed his blood making you his own. You, you, my dear friends, like Abram and Lazarus are incredibly rich in everything that matters. For your eternal, well, your eternal retirement will be in paradise, living in the very presence of God himself. No more loss, no more sorrow, no more tears of heartache. But living with God in paradise forever. So repent. And trust. Amen. We stand for prayer. Eternal God, you have made us and all creatures. You have given us our bodies and souls, our reason and senses, and you continue to take care of us. 
Calm our anxious hearts when we worry. Remind us of your fatherly divine goodness and mercy. Give us thankful hearts that look to you in patient trust as you give us all things that we need for our bodies and lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, graciously forgive all our sins of thought, word, and deed. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, working in our hearts and minds, through your Holy Word, help us to amend our sinful lives and to live as you would have us live. Help us to be content with the many good things you've already given us and protect us from the selfishness and consumerism of our day so that we might instead concern ourselves with helping others obtain, keep, and enjoy what is theirs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the church, your gospel is the good news which brings salvation to everyone who believes. Help us to be zealous in proclaiming the gospel by your spirit instilling us and throughout the entire church mouths to speak boldly of your good news of salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, Look with favor upon, upon the countries of the world. Calm tensions between warring groups so that your children on earth may live together in harmony and peace. Forgive our nation in the many ways we err and preserve among us justice, honor, and integrity that we may live in peace. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. By your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Remind them that they are not forgotten, but resting in your loving hands. We commit them to your gracious mercy and protection, and we pray, if it be your will, that you will restore them to health and strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, bestow your blessing on the vocation of fatherhood, that fathers would love and provide for their families and children, and that children would respect and honor their fathers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, gracious Father, you established the institution of marriage, and you desire that we keep it holy. Be with Sarah and Daniel as they prepare to be joined as wife and husband here at this altar later this week. And continue to bless all those who once pledged their loving commitment to one another and who remain joined as husband and wife. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Here we go.
We stand, and I invite you to turn to hymn 781.
body of Christ given for you. Take a drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Go in peace, for sin has been forgiven.
And may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in both body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy. Amen. We stand. saints 